Hey guys, this is Lance and Matt, and you're listening to Project Offbeat, a podcast that helps you explore careers outside your usual corporate setup. Learn from the perspectives of historians, gamers, teachers, and the like, and apply it in your workplace and life. Here we are again with another episode. Lance, kamusta ka? Uh, Matt, uh, actually, so I was a bit under the weather today. No? I, I took a leave from work. Uh, I feel like I caught a virus from my dad uh, <laughs> when we went to Tagaytay. Uh, but, you know, we make things work for the pod, right? Uh, we're always here um, and it's always the funnest part of the pod when when we're meeting new people, new guests, diba? Right? And that's exactly what we have today, you know? So, yun, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hyped for the episode today. Ito yung, ano, ito yung medicine mo, no? <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I think the conversation today will be our medicine for, yeah, for our and, illness. And uh, I guess for our listeners, we're also preparing for our season three. We've done a lot of rebranding recently and we're partnering with really top brands, I think. Uh, I'm not sure if we should say it now, but hopefully you guys can see it in our posters and our branding in IG and whatnot. I guess let's get this started, no? In today's episode, we're featuring the offbeaten career of photography and visual storytelling. Some photographers specialize in sports, some fashion, uh, human events, etc. But our guest today specializes in capturing through his lens, environmental and wildlife conservation. Our speaker today is an international award-winning conservation photographer, a mountaineer, an engineer, and a storyteller. He is the co-founder of Youth Engaged in Wetlands, an international nonprofit youth organization for the conservation of wetlands and migratory birds. Through his works, he was also recognized by Generation T last 2020, the organization that lists down the top leaders of tomorrow who are shaping Asia's future. Well, our guest today is none other than National Geographic Explorer, Nikon Asia Ambassador, and columnist for the Manila Times, Gab Mejia. He joins the Project Offbeat podcast today to talk about his love of nature, photography, and covering the climate crisis, nature, and indigenous peoples. Good evening, Gab, and welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, Matt. Hey, Lance. Thanks so much for having me here. You know, it's such an opportunity, a great opportunity to be able to, I guess, share stories and meaning, hopefully meaningful conversations through this podcast. Yeah. Thank you, Gab. Thank you, Gab. Uh, it's, it's also a, a, a delight to be with uh, someone of your stature, you know, Generation T, for <laughs> oh 30 God, under no. 30. No, that uh, doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> what a humble person you are. No? Gab, can you kind of describe in your own words, I, I know we described it a little bit already, but can you describe like, what do you do, you know, for your career? Yeah, so I'm a freelance conservation photographer or a visual artist. So I usually do mainly photography work. So conservation, meaning nature, um, wildlife. So in that, way, in that sense, I am creating stories, photographs, photo essays, documentaries to be able to capture wildlife and, you know, the issues that are facing our environment, our the climate, uh, and even our local communities around the Philippines and Southeast Asia. And that's really the essence of conservation photography, of how I can use the power of visual storytelling to be able to protect and conserve are different ecosystems like mountains, forests, wetlands, oceans, and protected areas all around the world. Um, and I guess, you know, in freelance, it's, it's a really different um, field, especially a different genre in photography. So unlike fashion or commercial, it's really inclined to working with nonprofits, working with other publications, and also, of course, adding the documentary and journalistic side to uh, the field of photography. When we actually were talking to Matt, no, uh, on guessing you to the show. So first, I told him, Matt, you know, this is our opportunity to focus on the on the career of photography. But then Matt told me, bro, what if conservation photography specifically, yung highlight natin, right? And that's what makes you so unique, no? Could you talk to us about how you um, specialized in this specific um, world of 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 conservation photography? Because I have a lot of friends that are sports photographers fashion photographers, food photographers, right? And they're basically a bit more common than usual. But it is the first time that I'm meeting someone of your, of your um, profession, conservation photographer. How did you uh, get to this place? Well, I think that's a true fact, Lance. Um, the fact that conservation photography isn't as prominent here as a genre of photography. Because honestly, there's not really any you know, former professional conservation photographers that we looked up to here in the Philippines. 
I um, mean, there's, there's a lot of political factors, a lot of um, financial economic factors, such as, you know, photography is a privileged career, honestly, here in the Philippines. So people tend to not go into that field of photography. So that's why not a lot of people go into conservation photography. I guess I would say I acknowledge my privilege that I have the opportunity to be able to pursue a career in the arts or uh, in media and photography. Integrating conservation or nature was really brought up by my privilege of inspiration, or I would say like the inspiration that I got at an early age. So I was reading National Geographic magazines. Mm -hmm. I was seeing all these amazing photographers from yep. foreign countries who mm -hmm. had that privilege, uh, the Western world to be able to you know, buy expensive lenses, telephoto lenses to capture wildlife um, and go, go to a different and to a country in the global South to cover issues on the environment. So it's only now actually that, the prog that there's a certain progress in conservation photography here in the Philippines um, that focuses on environmental issues, uh, the climate crisis. And that love really, I guess, started with me when I was 13, if I would be more specific. I was hiking with my dad all the time. And my dad really introduced me to the mountains. Um, I would be wow. hiking in Rizal. I would be hiking in the Sierra Madre. I would be hiking in Laguna, in Makiling, in Bataan. And I saw the beauty of the Philippines and I wanted to encapsulate those memories that I had shared with those places from my childhood, from my past. For sure. I, I realized, oh, what about, is there any field in heck in this world that could allow me to harness and nurture that love for the environment, that love for the nature? While at the same time, you know, discovering photography as a medium that could be able to capture and encapsulate those memories that I had and how I can yeah. actually use those for the better. I, I, I truly appreciate how you see things, no? because um, there's a lot of my circles that tell me going abroad has always been the nicer route in terms of seeing great tourist places, the, the US and the like, right? But what I always tell them as well is, you know what, Philippines has so much to offer, but we just don't know where to go. Diba? Or hindi natin alam. Kunari, whenever I'm looking for a picnic date, uh, where yes. a picnic place to go to, um, Rizal lagi yung go-to place ko. No? So I, I really appreciate how you mentioned those many, many places that you've seen the Philippines and its core beauty. No? Um, papaturo ko sa'yo, Gab, uh, wow. where to go in the Philippines no? um, to really explore those places. And uh, I think it's also kind of important. It, it's a topic that comes from time to time uh, when, whenever we do these Project Offbeat uh, interviews is that the people that actually can go and do these offbeat careers, oftentimes they're the ones who actually have privilege to do so. Or, um, and I think that's really important to note because not a lot of people are willing to just like go for the offbeat career without like uh, having that. You know what I mean? So like, I really appreciate that you kind of acknowledged your some some form of privilege as well because, you know, I, I think it's important to note whenever you go the off-beaten route, sometimes there are some real-world um, aspects that you have to consider before actually going through with it, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and I guess a side note on that, Matt, also, you know, I, I've been thinking about, you know, is, is passion, like pursuing these off-beat career really a price to pay that there's really a price to pay mm -hmm. and i guess like just to share some experiences like working with people of you know underserved communities who who would say have a relative less privilege than us um they go to offbeat careers too you know there are wildlife rangers conservation mm -hmm. um, leaders who would go to ngos or would go be protecting the parks and i would meet these families and communities around the philippines who don't have you know a contractual job or like a very secure job uh, for their livelihoods but they pursue these careers of for example these tamarau rangers or the wildlife rangers of um, the tamara which is a critically endangered dwarf buffalo found in mindoro and mm -hmm. the people who have been working to protect the tamarau are you know ser have served their uh the conservation industry for about you know, more than 20 years of their life. And they come from um, underserved communities. And, you know, you, you realize that their passion and their love to protect wildlife, um, these passions, these different offbeat tracks, I would say, or like careers don't necessarily mean that there's a price to pay because they could have just left that job and actually yeah. find another job elsewhere. But yeah. you know, because of their dedication, their love for nature, they, 
they do these, uh, they continue to serve um, for conservation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I, I guess back to your, um, your profession or your career as a freelance conservation photographer, can you kind of like describe your process in actually taking or looking for stories to capture and like choosing which stories to tell? Well, I always go to the core of, um, I guess, my, my purpose, which is really to serve nature and really try to create impactful for the country or for society at large. Um, mm-hmm. So for the stories that I specifically choose, I really try to find and research something that kind of speaks to me in a way. For, my, for conservation work, it's generally not the same as news or you know, the, the things, the stories that we see on breaking news. Yeah. So it's more of a long form narrative. So in long form, meaning it takes time. It takes a lot of time to, to build up a story or to, to research upon a story because most of the times these are brought, for example, like environmental stories, climate change, which have a very long temporal um, meaning or like a long temporal pace. So these kinds of uh, the stories that I choose specifically would be one for my advocacy, which is wetlands. Mm -hmm. Um, or the climate change or talking about issues about climate change or for example wildlife you know and the spectrum of wildlife for example how these animals have been dwindling for the 20 years or like for the the next five years so that's how I really choose stories and I specifically choose more local stories and as a freelancer it's also different because I do work with National Geographic, so I don't necessarily have to work for them all the time, but mm-hmm. I do get assignments, I do get projects that they would send me on the field. So it's like a case-to-case basis. There is mm-hmm. the long-form narratives, which I choose. So I pitch the stories. Um, and there's the assignments, which is this media publication or this media platform will send you and make you travel to go to these different places. So it's like a, re- a, a, a like an in-between uh, choice to 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 make yeah uh, you have the option to do assignments and long form uh, narratives no as a photographer what are the differences between these two um do, can i assume that assignments are like um photo albums or like a list of photos that you have to take and long form narratives have a have a have a cadence or have a order to it um what are the differences between uh, these uh tasks so usually assignments, I don't have agency on the story. So for example, I see. Yeah. okay, so I don't have agency on the story. Well, long form, I have a, the agency to choose. So I can go to a certain place back and back and research about the people, build the trust for the community. But on an assignment, I would be, for example, I just did one for Singapore, where I was just sent to Singapore to take photos of unseen Singapore, which are like the wildlife in Singapore and the things that people oh. don't necessarily see. Mm-hmm in the urban landscape. So yep. I didn't get to research that, but they, you know, as my skill set involved is in conservation, in wildlife, um, and travel, they sent me on this assignment because it fits the job. But like for long form, it's it's different because I get to choose, for example, a long form story that I did was in the Agusan marshlands. Um, and I worked there for two years, going back and forth several times wow. within a year. Uh, to cover the effects of the prolonged droughts that were happening, wow. and as well as the, the man-made mm-hmm. fires um, in the, the destruction of the wetlands, of the marsh. So it took a long time because I had to go there depending on the season, depending if it's summer, depending if it's um, flooding time, the monsoon, and I had to capture it in different forms. Unlike the assignment where I would be sent to cover, for example, a certain story already. So that's really the main difference, the agency that I have. How long though usually um, if you're tasked to like cover a place in Singapore or you know these long form narratives gano katagal yung getting to know the people capturing their moments capturing their emotions then telling that story i assume perhaps a month is that safe to say no not at all actually it's much shorter in for example oh. for assignments it would take just a week you have to oh, okay. accomplish everything, get all those emotions, <laughs> you know, be vulnerable, be open to these people that you have never met in your wow. life. So it's wow. a, there's a real, also a real struggle. And it's a, a skill set that you have that you're be able to connect at once with someone, yep. even like who doesn't speak the same language or who has only seen you and might see you once in their life. You know, Karabe. 
compared to like the long form where I have to really build trust because there's a lot of sensitivity with working right. with communities. There's a lot of sensitivity that comes with, I guess, cultural differences. So mm-hmm. um, it's it, it really it's a really case to case basis. Right, right. But I guess in this case to case basis, uh, a majority of your conservation photography does it focus on something specifically? Yeah, usually it's like I'm focusing on wetlands, um, and I also focus on people, environmental defenders. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a real issue here in the Philippines as one of the deadliest country for environmental env- environmental defenders. So it really, de- I guess I'm just working through the local context that I have, right. you know, and the research that I know and the, the access that I may have. Um, so it's, it really comes with the planning because I can plan. I'm also like working on other stories, like, and it's a time consuming process because in a year you only have like a short amount of time and you need to, do other projects to, you know, to fill your coffers. But um, like I'm working on a story about volcanoes. I could, I'm right now, like in, the, in this year, I'm like working on a story on volcanoes. I'm working on a story about sea turtles in La Union. And mm-hmm. I'm also working about a long form story about environmental defenders and environmental justice. So I've set my mind to do this three long form narratives that I want to work, but during my time where I could be sent on an assignment or like a commission project, I would also do that. So it's like a balance of like, oh, I have scheduled this, I have scheduled there, and I would go here and travel there. So there's a lot of planning and a lot of scheduling and also right, but, choosing what I want. But uh, I guess why I'm asking about like, what are you focusing on specifically is um, wetlands, right? So how did you kind of like pinpoint that that was what you wanted to focus on? Um, or was it more of like along the way you kind of discovered it or well I guess it's like a compounding series of moments in my life that mm-hmm. I realized I wanted to cover this so one wetlands um, my mom grew up in uh, a wetland in Hagonoy in Bulacan and mm-hmm. sometimes you know, during family trips I would be visiting that place and now it's like the sea level rise the tides have been rising and I've seen how this whole debacle that we're having in even in Metro Manila, you know, the whole Metro Manila, whole Manila is built on a wetlands. Even the name of Manila was came from a plant. Wow. From an indigo really? <laughs> plant. A plant wow. that produces indigo U that right. um that you know is based. So like imagine all our cities are built on wetlands, but nobody knows about it. Exactly. So I had that thought, why aren't like stories being told about wetlands? You know, we're always flooded we all have all these issues about typhoons. Then mm. I, when I started going more to the science behind these wetlands, I started realizing, wow, you know, actual, the actual awareness and the actual understanding of wetlands could literally help the country. Yep. Uh, you know, like how we develop cities, how we situate communities, how we Dilling. prevent mm-hmm. and mitigate disasters from typhoons or um, droughts. And like wetlands is, you know, in the science behind it, like just give us a, a background it's um, it you know it absorbs three times more carbon than all our world's forests so like the peat really so imagine yeah. in the small amount of wetlands that we have around the world compared to the area of forest that we have um, you know it's such a powerful um, powerful ecosystem and it's not something that you see in our textbooks you know we know about exactly. oceans we know about forests we know about mountains but most part, I guess, in growing up, I, I, you know, the only wetlands that we have seen was in Shrek, you know, the swamps. <laughs> and, and people portray it as, you know, as something scary, something disgusting, muddy. Yeah. Muddy, uh, but, yeah. But, you know, we have communities here in the Philippines, like the Manobo tribe that I've worked with in the Ayusan Marsh, who have, you know, see magic in these places where the fairies or like what the fairies you see in Shrek they do also have this deep reverence with the marsh and, right. you know, yeah. have spirits. They have like crocodile spirits. They're whole- Thank you, Gab, uh, for that illumination. No? Um, you, you're right. Parang wetlands are, are something that we have to still Google. Uh, I don't understand it myself. No? So thank you for that 101 um, and, and that value pala ng, ng wetlands. No? I guess um, I want to parang go deeper into the process that you mentioned earlier. Diba? You mentioned 
uh, when you're going to these uh, communities, you, you in, in one week's time, you got to get to know them, you got to make them vulnerable and whatnot. Do you have any tips on how do you actually get to these communities, right? Because I have this friend who, um, visual storyteller naman siya and photographer naman siya on human rights, right? And it's so hard, specifically human rights, like right? talking about such a sensitive topic to to these people and getting them to open up, right? And you see these posts ng Humans of New York, diba? Nakala mo, ang dali-dali mag-open up ng mga tao and write a beautiful post about it. But I'm sure the process and getting to know these people and getting them to open up is a, a task indeed, no? Um, could you take us through how you do that process with communities? Yeah, so especially with sensitive, you know, communities that needs to be taken with care and sensitivity, um, there's a way that language helps, first of all, speaking. Maruno mag Tagalog. So yep. being able to speak fluent Tagalog is one barrier uh, that helps a lot, you know, being able to share. Um, and I guess the genuine kind of trust building really comes in the form of time. Um, I have to, before I even take out a camera, I would have to meet with the elders, you know, perform certain rituals, you know, share a meal. Um, talk with them about life, talk, talk with them about their families, their problems, their dreams and hopes, and you know, share that as a person that may be coming from a different part spectrum of the world or you know, a different whole totally different universe and just be open about their experience and how just being able to listen. I think you know, listening is a tool that has been very uncommon these days. And I think as a storyteller, that's one of the greatest tools that you could have, especially if you want to build trust with communities, with cultural sensitivities, uh, removing all your biases, all your prejudice. Um, I guess really that's the, the process. You know, it's just being more human with these people. And it's a tough thing to do. Yep, yep. Uh, it, 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 it gets me back to this time in Ateneo where maybe you've also experienced it too during your time in um, senior high, you know, like, they, they let us do this immersion program, right? Where you have to live with a, with a, a set of community and you have to get to know them. And then when you go back to Ateneo, you write about it, right? So I could imagine the struggle because I, I have to admit, it's, it's so hard. It's, it's, not, it's not your usual comfort, but it's not your usual house and shelter, right? So, ang hirap pala ng trabaho mo on being this visual storyteller. And it has to be like a two-way street. Eh? It's not enough that you're willing to kind of like talk to them. They also have to be willing to talk to you. So yeah, I can definitely imagine, especially you have to bring out your camera and take pictures of them. I can imagine how sensitive um, other people might be in that community. Right? Um, yeah. In line with that topic, have you ever received any criticism or feedback from maybe people have vested interest in the community or the lands that you take pictures of? Yeah, I, I, when I was doing the Marsh Project, the Agusan Marsh Project, I did receive threats and like, you know, very insidious and even like borderline death threats um, yeah, from okay. like, um, yeah, vested interests, you know, um, palm oil plantation companies. Um, I don't know if, you're, if you can put that in the podcast, but, you know, just for city, I guess it's like, there's a lot of even like children or owners of these co- companies that are destroying the environment or destroying the marsh. After this photo went viral of the, the burning of the marsh happened and like we caught like some people, you know, burning these marsh and like, and like the story behind it, it's, it's a threat. These things are th- threats for the marsh. And I receive trolls, I receive in my email, even like threats um, in Instagram about like, who took this photo? You're spreading lies and all of these things. And like, you know, but it's like yeah. a whole reporting because nobody's reporting these stories. That's why nobody knows about them. Um, but you know you gotta keep an open mind, I guess, and like listen to what they have to hear uh, hear to say because they, you know, they're conditioned to see their world as the most important thing or something that's. Um, and I guess that's the the truth in being um, a reporter, like a, a a storyteller, is how can I do no harm, but at the same time, be as impactful um, and as objective with the stories that I tell right because and the, the threats are real like we had to stop working for a few months because it reached the dnr or the department of environmental and natural oh. resources um 
um, it reached the governors um, that we kind of had to lay low because you know it's not me who's living there. Um, there are yeah. people, and they'll be asking who who's worked with him, who uh, who helped him find these certain locations, who, who was exploring with him, who was uh, you know. And it's not my life, you know. It's the lives of these local communities, these people who were helping with the project, who were um, helping tell these um, stories that were forgotten or ignored or you know silenced. So yeah, there's a lot of criticism in this work, you know, especially here in the Philippines. Uh, we're the deadliest country for environmental defenders in Asia, and you know we're a deadly country for journalists. So it's like a double whammy. Yeah. Um, but the more that we need to speak more about it the more that you realize how urgent and how important these issues are because there's a lot of negative criticism who will be pushing onto you. And, you know, you got to take real precaution, but keep on fighting, keep making noise and keep telling these stories. Yeah, I, I, I guess, Gab, before then I worked in Meralco, no? where Meralco was a lot of criticisms from uh, environmentalists who are really cautious or who or are really sensitive in the usage of coal because it really destroys you know our our environment no and parang naisip ko lang no um, what do you think is with these um corporate professionals or or business tycoons um bakit nila parang ano yung hindi nila nakikita or ano yung kailangan nating i-illuminate sa kanila uh, for them to actually show more value to to our environment, to our wetlands specifically, right? Uh, is it because they just lack some exposure to the communities that are affected by their decisions, or um, what is this lacking? No, because parang me and Matt, I, honestly, we're also we we also feel like we're lacking in that aspect. Na parang when you talked about it now, it feels so new to us. It feels so surreal to us, right? But this has to be given more voice, diba? Ano yung parang kailangan uh, matutunan or ma-illuminate ng mga corporate guys right now? Yeah, you're right. Um, the one part is ignorance or apathy. You know, they don't know about these issues. Yeah. We don't have conservation photography. We don't have so much conservation photographers here in the Philippines. Um, like, for example, that Marsh project that we did, it was the governor only found out about these fires because of the, the story that we did. And because of this, we started taking more action, trying to help the DNR, trying to help the BMB or the, the guardians of the marsh to, you know, to ramp up their enforcement and protecting these. Um, but I guess for in, in case of like corporations, it's we're so detached. You know, I feel like growing up in the city, growing up in Manila um, and so these bad. ivory towers, so we're bad. so detached from nature. You ask a CEO, because uh, I also do work with the, um, with, WWF, which is the worldwide, the largest mm. conservation organization here in the Philippines. And working as part of the board, you know, you, you meet all these lucrative CEOs and industry leaders. Yes, sir. Yep. And it's not that they're unaware, it's just, you know, it's hard for them to compromise also. I don't know, money, um, greed, probably. Um, and of course, the disconnect we have. But there's, you know, it's not a simple, you know, um, it's not... A really simple case. There's a lot of complex political and economical um, issues intertwined with, you know, protecting nature. Our education system, um, one, we don't even have environmental science. We don't have even like growing up as a child, right? The stories that we hear about the environment are, are far, like polar bears, lions, zebras. We don't even know what Philippine eagles are. We're not taught of our local context. So how can people at the, um, how can you expect adults who have the power, have the exactly. resources to be able to, to fix problems or know more about these issues when at a young age, a lot of these people have, or a lot of our society have not been educated about it, have been given the condition to, to learn more about and connect with nature and our spaces, you know, like in Metro Manila, we don't have green spaces. How can people, Go out in the park and appreciate nature and see the benefits of it. You go to different countries, you go to a park, you go by the river, walk by the river, how clean, how beautiful. And um, there's just so many factors. It's just so, it's a really, really complex. But education, um, lack of education and disconnect is one of the major um, issues driving this. Yeah, I hope, Gab, next time you, you create a course specifically for... <laughs> 
you know, for you know, wetlands for the bug. Maybe you could join NAS or anyone else and create a course for it. That way we can have more education. I, I completely agree with you. You've already been involved in so much work with this. You you already mentioned you're you're with the WWF, you're with National Geographic, you're with Nikon Asia, etc. You're a columnist for the Manila Times. Uh, you have a weekly column there as well. I guess, do you feel like your work is influencing the change or creating the impact that you want to see in the world today? Um, I see it in small fragments. You know, the, the, thing with it, the thing with conservation or, you know, working for a cause bigger than society and the whole fate yeah, of the humanity. Right. I mean, like, with the things happening with the droughts around, you know, Africa and Sri Lanka and South Asia right now. Mm, um, yeah. I think really it comes in the local communities, how you really impact with the local communities. I think that's where I really see the change. Um, the small things that are happening with the Agusan Marsh, how it started becoming protected. For example, we did a story in the Tamarau and through photos, through stories, through campaigning, we were able to earn about like, you know, and fundraise about a million, about one point. 2 million pesos just to secure the livelihoods of Tamarau Rangers for the next years, you know, who was financially constrained by the pandemic. Yeah. So these, these things, these small things, you, you gain power and you draw strength from these small communities and NGOs you work with. And that's where you see, truly see a lot of change. And I think you see that in the microcosm of the Philippine um, politics, you know, governments, how it's it, as much as the executive branch has a lot of power, the real change happens within the LGUs. The real change happens within the mayor, the barangay level, right? And yeah. you see it in Metro Manila, how you would compare Makati versus Quezon City because Makati or like Pasig, Pasig might have a better governance. So I think that's how I see the impact of the conservation work. It's happening. It's mm. real but it's working in small fragments that can hopefully culminate into a greater, greater change and compound to, you know, a more national level. Yeah, I hope so too. And uh, hopefully I hope more of our listeners as well can follow your footsteps as well in um, taking care of the government, uh, taking care of the environment. I'm sorry. <laughs> we should also take care of our government. You know, because... <laughs> I mean that's the biggest <laughs> that's the biggest thing to to take care of right now. Yeah, uh, you know, every time I say like when you wake up as a Filipino, it's like you're already working as a for an NGO the moment you were born. <laughs> you know, because you like have to fix something and take care of your government when they should be the ones taking care of their people. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, I mean, if ever anyone listening right now or act- is actually interested in getting into uh conservation photography. Um, are, is there like any advice uh, you would share to them to get started? No. Yeah, I think you know you start locally. You start with a, the tip of your fingers. Um, follow conservation organizations. You know, there's a lot of NGOs and youth organizations like National Geographic, like WWF, like um, For the Future, Waves for Water, Youth Engaged Wetlands. There's so many. Organiza- organizations and communities also working in conservation, but specifically specifically for conservation photography, um, you know, you you work with the local NGOs, you know, uh, wildlife foundations. You have the Philippine Eagle Foundation, you have the Tarshir Foundation, you have the Mabuaya Foundation, uh, you have the Tamarau Conservation Program. So I guess it's really taking that initiative. Um, you just have to do the research because I I didn't know about these conservation stuff also when I was, you know, I only got into it in university, when I got into university, when I mm. joined um, a university organization called Marine Biological Society, which is a skin diving organization. Mm. And that's how I really got exposed of how big this community is that's protecting the environment. And I just volunteered. I worked harder um, in getting into that sphere while pursuing photography. And um, that's how I merged it. You know, I just suddenly in a you know, had like this light bulb moment that just integrate my love for the environment, my experience with the environment with photography. Gab, how about in terms of the visual storytelling uh, or, or the photography part? Um, how do you get started into that? Do, do you learn it from a site or something? Uh, I really learned through practice and I, 
you know, I, I don't say that I'm self-taught because I have had a lot of mentors. I had a lot of teachers along the way in university um, with my um, brothers in the internet, YouTube, um, even like following on Instagram, these top photographers from National Geographic, from Magnum Photos, from all these even local photographers, of course, you know, inspirations from the local photography scene. I was just so inspired seeing their works that maybe I can do it. I have a camera. It's easy to get a camera now. You have it on your phone. Yeah. You have it on your, you can buy it. You know, I start, I even, I, I didn't even start with like a professional camera. I started with a point and shoot camera um, and mobile photography. And that's how it just started and started that, oh, maybe you can actually make this a profession. Is so, there any, anyone you want to shout out <laughs> in this know, podcast? Would, yeah, I, I would love to shout out like one of my great um, inspirations and mentors. Uh, and of course, a good friend, Hannah Reyes Morales. She's the one really trailblazing that photography world. Um, especially in documentary uh, and people and society. Um, there's, a lot, there's really a lot of photographers. I mean, you know, they have been a source of inspiration and they have been a source of a lot of teachings. So you just follow them and, you know, you, you dream. I guess you really dream that you can be one. You manifest and you work, you work your way to it. Um, it can happen. It will happen. Gab, um, we're actually doing the Offbeat podcast for... Uh, corporate professionals no and um you know what we're trying to do is really expose them to what you're exactly telling us right now about the education of wetlands and these careers that they're not usually aware on but i want to ask you parang kung corporate professional ka you're well embedded into that right now you're earning big bucks right what do you think is the value for them to hear about this episode and to hear about this this thing that you're preaching right now in their workplace. Meron bang kabuluhan tong um, tinuturo natin or dinadala natin sa kanila um, if they're all thinking about revenues, if they're thinking about profits day in and day out? Yeah, you know, <laughs> the fact that our gas prices are increasing by a huge amount, <laughs> you know, yeah. like the whole interconnected world that we live in, nature, environment, and like how this war is also about coal and like how all the expenses that you're spending on revenues, on your logistics, for your trucks, for your, um, you know, this inflation, it's all because of climate change. It's all because of, you know, war for oil, war for coal. Yeah. Um, you know, even McDonald's, you know, you, should, you start realizing you can't even order large fries anymore because um, it's, you know, the lack of potatoes, the lack of farmlands um, that we had in the Ukraine and Russian war. You know, there's a lot of things that you have the things that you see in the news that I believe, I feel like the, the CEOs, these people in the corporate world are seeing and, you know, blaming whatever war this is, but it's all because of resources, natural right. resources that we have. And as a conservation photographer, that's what we're trying to protect. And it sucks to realize that we're the ones still at threat when all we want to do is to protect the luxury, the comfort that you these corporate leaders have, or you know, these people um, who may not succumb to the effects of the climate crisis because you know they're privileged, um, they have the resources to do it. But at the end of the day, you know, you you look at countries, you see them. You don't want to be like um, you follow the footsteps of what's happening um, from other you know underserved countries or like we're part of the global south and we think we're such a developed country. But in truth, at the end of the day, at the bigger scheme of geopolitics we're, we're always going to be kind of the, the smaller fish in this pond so um, yeah you know, there's a lot there's a lot of learning i guess um to go but you realize the interconnected thing even like the small things like running out of water you know the high amount of um electricity that you pay it's because we're lacking natural resources and we don't have an industry that's sustainable enough to to, to support that and it's you know because of their struggle everyone's gonna struggle you know exactly para ang dali i, i summarize ng because uh, oil price hiked because Ukraine war or Bombo Marcos suddenly became <laughs> the president of the Philippines like come on like you're right you're right there's so much interconnectedness it's just 80% of the equation we don't know about or we don't get the news about Right, so I completely agree with you on that end, uh, Gab. 
And I think we mentioned it with, I think one of our guests as well, where they're fighting for the world they want to live in or something like that to that effect. So I really commend the work that you've been doing because obviously this is really important work and it's not everyone that can just, you know, just do this, right? So definitely uh, I hope everyone, all of our listeners can get a few tidbits here and there about protecting the environment, having a heart basically, uh, and taking care of Mother Nature, hopefully at the end of this episode. So yeah, thank you for taking us off the off-beaten path, Gab. We really appreciate you on this episode. Can you let people know what you're doing right now and what you're excited about? Well, yeah, I, I, I'm really just excited to create more. I, I'm trying to expand also with documentary, going to film, going to, to more art museums and um, really producing work, um, You know, going to volcanoes, going to... Um, other parts of the Philippines traveling again because I, I recently just came from also from Korea and like just traveling I think but there's like a lot of things to be excited about you know because it's, you know I think it's a very heavy topic to think about like the environment and climate change destruction death whatever but you know there's still a lot of beauty in the world and there's like a lot of wonders in the Philippines that we need to start yeah. Do. And I think we just need to go out there and really explore and see it for our own eyes, you know, take a hike, uh, go to the beach, go diving. Um, and just yeah. like Gab, really Gab, after this show, I'm asking you where to hike, where to go <laughs> yeah. to the beach and how to go to a volcano. Tanong natin yan, Matt, after the show. Yeah. If anyone wants to contact you, can you, um, how can they contact you? Well, I do have my website. So it's just my www.gabmejia, so G-A-B-M-E-J-I-A.com. And I do have an Instagram. So it's uh, also my um, name. So it's just Gab Media. And that's, it's, I usually just post photographs and the, the works that I, I have. Awesome, awesome. And uh, I guess as a close, this is something we ask most of, uh, if not all of our offbeat guests uh, at the end of the show. In your own words, basically, what for you is taking the off-beaten path? I think in my own words, uh, taking the off-beating path is just really, you know, as cliche as it sounds, is to really follow, oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to say it, follow your heart <laughs> or like really <laughs> follow your passions and dreams. Um, there's a lot that society, our families have conditioned and have forced to learn on us of what's successful, um, you know, being taking a profession in engineering, um, management whatever uh, um, law doctor and that's the only way to life i think taking the off beaten track is really you know to use that knowledge with whatever you gain from your parents from society but make it your own you know you have your agency for your life and use that in being able to solve something bigger than yourself and i think that will always be the off beaten track because you find a problem uh, you find it, it um, crisis that you're dealing with personally dealing or you, what you're passionate about and you just go for it and use the tools that you have and that you know that is the off-beaten track because I feel like you know you can be a doctor but still do an off-beaten track by being a doctor of the province or the barrio barrio doctors and, you know, yeah you can in helping exactly. save a community or like be a lawyer and you know do environmental law and help you know save the environmental defenders from exactly. being imprisoned and incarcerated. So it's, it really depends, you know, what you have now, just use that tool and just go. And then, no, because like, parang, I know that we're ending, right? But I just remembered all of my photographer friends, diba? And naisip ko lang, you know, instead of going to the next wedding to cover uh, photography on, um, why not, you know, try out something more um, offbeat no? or much more dangerous like what you're doing right now, no? So yeah, yeah, Gab, thank you for just giving us courage and giving us inspiration to take the offbeat in path. Thanks so much, Lance, and thanks so much, Matt. All right, thank you for listening to the show. If you liked our show, follow us as well on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube for exclusive content. That's at the Project Offbeat. See you in the next episode, and here's to taking the hashtag off the beaten path. Thanks so much, Gab. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.